Hello, everybody. Um, Andrew and I are here uh, to talk about um, the developer OWASP developer guide and how it came about. And for all of you out there, Andrew Van Der Stock is the executive director of uh, OWASP Foundation. And um, he was one of the first members to be a part of the OWASP developer guide. Um, that's it. Uh, Andrew, uh, welcome. And many, many thanks for joining this podcast. Um, would you would you please explain, uh, you know, how this OWASP developer guide came about? Because I know it's it's a very important part of uh, OWASP projects, and it's really really helpful to the developers. Yeah, sure. So um, when the OWASP um, project got going, um, it actually revolved around a small number of projects, but the developer guide was the key one. Um, so people were working on it collaboratively. Um, uh, writing various sections. So the first version was about 87 pages long, if I recall correctly. Uh, so version 1.0, it was written in a very, very quick amount of time. It was um, basically about five or six people. Um, and they got it done from pretty much September uh, to around November, December uh, of 2001. And there was a real need back then to like let folks know all about the different attacks and how to avoid them. And so the focus on developers was the right thing, but it really got used as this is how you hack web apps. Um, so it was uh, already being misused from the very word go. Um, in some ways though, um, later versions of the guide, including the version that I was responsible for, version 2.0, um, did focus in on the developer aspect of it and actually looked at the code uh, and provided code snippets um, for Java. One of the things that we just never foresaw um, was literally the just the proliferation of all these different frameworks and languages and things like that. It's just really difficult now to have uh, a single developer guide. Whereas back then, if you catered towards the Java community, uh, you were pretty much covering most of the web developer community of the time. And so that's what we did. Um, so initially, um, I, I came to OWASP not in September of 2001, but in November of 2001. So I've been around the, the, the organization for a very, very long time. And I got involved in the version 1.1.1 version. So there was already in, like an addition, like 1.0 had been released. And it was hugely popular. Um, lots and lots of folks from um, consultancies and web app pen testers and whatnot were basically saying, oh, you've missed out this thing. You've missed out that thing. And I knew from my own work, because I've been doing web application security uh, code reviews and uh, web app testing since 1998, um, I knew of things that weren't in the developer guide. And I wanted to put them down because everyone needed to know about them. And so I started contributing. By The, the first version was written in Microsoft Word. 1.1 and 1.1.1 were written in XML. You could almost smell the fear of people not wanting to edit in XML. So technology choices for a document can be passionate. People were saying, oh, it should always be like machine readable and blah, blah, blah. Um, obviously back then we didn't have Markdown, um, but there are times and a place where uh, a document that was in its early stages of being built uh, really, really, really should have stayed in Microsoft Word because a large word processor for a large document is exactly the right thing to do. Changing the format to XML gave absolutely no technical benefits whatsoever, and it killed off contributions. And that's where I came in in uh, like 2001, because it took until 2005 for version two to be released. And I only really started on version two in around 2003. Um, I worked for 18 months basically 18 hours a day. I did my day job, came home and started just typing, wrote 
the better part of 200,000 words. And there were just so few contributors. Um, it was actually very disappointing. Um, it was my first real lesson in you've got to have a culture of collaboration and a culture of um, contributions. Um, back then, coding together was a very common thing. Writing together was not common. Hmm. And so it was really interesting in those early days. Um, so the vast majority of the version 2.0 text is mine. There is some of the 1.0 and 1.1 text in there um, but fundamentally it got a complete rewrite from head to toe uh, in version 2.0 and it was only towards the end one side actually you know put it out there on SourceForge um, you needed to have Microsoft Word I'll put it back into Microsoft Word because you're not going to write a, a 300 page book in XML you're just not in fact Microsoft Word struggled uh, with the document so much, I had to break it up into a feature that's actually depreciated now uh, called master documents. Um, and so it's a master document and 23 sub documents. Wow. Um, and that was, you know, every time I tried to print it, it was a touch and go as to whether Microsoft Word would crash or not. So you basically had to start Word, open the master document, paginate it, cross your fingers it didn't crash and then print and then hope that it would actually print to PDF with all the headings and things like that. Um, so preparing the document for actual pre-press was a nightmare. Um, I'm glad that the newer versions of Office are a lot more stable, but that back then I was pushing the very boundaries of what Word could do. Um, but it was interesting. I got contributions towards the end of the document once it was actually mostly there and I am now a very big believer in if you've got something that's wrong, people will come and correct it for you. Yeah. So yeah. if you want to get something right, say something wrong, and people will come through and say, no, 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 this this way. As long as you have the, the ability to um, put up with people thinking you're an idiot, as long as you can put up with that, you can get lots of contributions. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Um, uh, well, that uh, all along, that's what I felt about OWASP. You know, when even when we started doing developer OWASP developer three dot uh, I think yeah, we started with three dot and then um, it wasn't really a lo lot of content over there, and mm. then restructured it, uh, and we added lots of do's and don'ts, and. Generally, and now we see there are contributions coming in. So mm. that's what I'm hoping, you know, when people hear your um, version of it and how you worked for a long number of hours and also in the long number of years in contributing to the guide, I'm hoping other people will come and then, you know, share their knowledge and share their uh, expertise on the guide. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So if I were to... Um, Say, the problem that you sought to address with a developer guide was to make sure that you have usable guidance for the developers so they can actually use it while they are writing their code. That's right. You know, the mistakes they need to avoid and all that. There's a universe of things that you can do wrong. Uh, I think the things that you can do right are much smaller. And so I, if I was to do the guide again today, I would be recommending you um, to write it in the positive frame of mind. Like, this is how you do a login form. This is how you do a password um, feature. Um, don't don't write it in the form of, you shouldn't accept password one, two, three. You know, if you're writing it in the negative, there's so many negatives. Whereas if you just give them, um, this is the correct way to write a password login form. Here's how to avoid passwords entirely. That is a much shorter book and it is going to produce a much more secure application at the end. Um, the only people who need the really deep guidance are the framework developers mm -hmm. and they really, really should be consulting with application security professionals. Mm -hmm. um, whereas your average developer in an enterprise environment or a home hobbyist or whatever, they're just looking for how do I get from A to B as quickly as possible? Well, 
tell them what to do. Don't tell them what not to do. Oh, that's a very positive message, Andrew. Thank you for that. You know, the positive reinforcement of doing the right things versus the laundry list of wrong things. Thank yeah. You. I mean, um, I, I come back to the, you know, like the the Christian Ten Commandments, not that I of that persuasion. Um, it's full of thou shalt nots, but people still do them. Whereas, <laughs> you know, if you told them how to live their lives in a full and nice way, I think honestly get a lot better traction. Um, I think it's the same with developers. Developers, uh, they want to do the right thing. Mm. And for them to get advice that's clear and, and ambiguous can really help them build an application that much faster. Um, like um, about the only piece of advice that I can give people to save them a lot of time is don't do password forget questions. Um, like, you know, the uh, what's your mother's maiden name? Don't don't implement that at all. That will save you hundreds of hours and tens of thousands of lines of code. Um, so that's about the only negative advice I would give someone is don't do that. But mm. everything else is like, here's how to do pass, um, you know, pass phrases. This is how to do... Um, you know, proper session management. This is how you do good input validation. Um, it, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, basically developers are only interested if they can absorb it quickly. If you give them a book that's three or 400 pages long. Oh, yes. They're not going to read it. No. Nobody's going to read. I mean, you and I wouldn't read that kind of book. I mean, it, it wouldn't, well, you want to know how to do things practically rather than, you know, reading books and then not being able to implement it at all. Yes, totally, totally. Mm. Now that, you know, since you worked with 1.0 and then 2.0, how do you feel that OWASP Developer Guide is in version 4.x? Um, I think recently we released 4.3.1 version. Oh, how fantastic. Um, honestly, that's the great thing about open source is that, um, you know, I've moved on from doing the developer guide and people took it up. It did take a while for people to take it up. That's mm -hmm. that contribution issue again. Um, it is a lot of work and it's, it can be overwhelming. And I'm just so glad that we've got contributors who are prepared to work on it. Because, um, you know, without having uh, active contributions, a project will die. We've had so many projects that I was like the, um, the Hive project and a few others um, the Honeycomb project is an, a perfect example. It had six or 700 entries of really interesting information of the mid 2000s. Oh. And then it died because oh. no one was looking after it. And okay. so um, in the end, I remember Jim Manico just asking for permission to delete it all because it was getting so stale. But that was an incredible contribution and someone did a lot of work on that. Um, but to then not have any contributors um, work on it afterwards is a big problem. Yes, indeed. Yes. Thank well, you. I'm really That's happy. It. I'm really happy that you've taken it up. I'm so glad. Thank you very much for that. Um, so any any final thoughts, uh, Andrew, on... on uh... I'm hoping that you can see my um, thing of putting Easter eggs into the actual developer guide and other things. Uh, every version of the OS Top 10 I've worked on and every version of the developer guide I've worked on have cat-related Easter eggs in them. Okay. Um, and when people find them, I'm mm -hmm. very, very pleased. But I, I don't hear about people finding them very often. Like, okay. for example, in the latest OS Top 10 2021, mm -hmm. if you can decode an MD5 hash and then translate it properly, there's a cat-related uh, Easter egg in there. Oh, wow, that's very interesting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope that someone finds the Easter egg in the latest developer guide or was developer guide as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you copy and paste any of the sample code, you might have, you might still have it. Okay. okay. But if you've started from scratch, you don't have it. <laughs> oh, we'll make sure we'll add those Easter uh, eggs into the guide and well make them your own that's what it's all about like you should be proud of having the ability to put a easter egg into your guide 
um, you know, as long as it doesn't change the context of what you're actually trying to say to them. Um, it, I think having something fun in there for people to discover is, is always amazing. Absolutely. And that makes uh, contributions and also making use of OWASP Developer Guide a lot more fun. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, with that, we question and very nice responses from Andrew. We come to the end of this podcast. Andrew, thank you very much for joining us and sharing your views and your history with OWASP Developer Guide. Thank you. No worries. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Thank you.